If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. For my wife and myself, it's wonderful to be with you. It's, uh, I wouldn't want to be any other place in the world this morning than here. Wonderful. This is Palm Sunday. We, uh, uh, certain churches like the Episcopal Church, you know, they, they run a, uh, uh, a yearly calendar, you know, and it's six weeks before Advent, five weeks before Advent, third week before Advent, Witch Sunday, Trinity Sunday, and all that. Uh, but it's easy to forget, but Palm Sunday, before, quote, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, Palm Sunday, when our Lord Jesus, after three and a half years of ministry, rode in to Jerusalem and to the temple on the donkey. And Matthew 21, I'd like to go through as we have time, some of the uh, things in this very rich chapter. Uh, we'll call it the Palm Sunday chapter. The Palm Sunday Psalm is 118. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent two disciples, Jesus two disciples, go unto the village against you, and straight away you will find this tied a colt with her. Uh, loose them and uh, bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straight away he will send them. And this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek and sitting upon a donkey and a colt the fall of a donkey. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded, verse 8, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strewed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. <clears throat> Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Well, may the Lord bless this reading of his word. After three and a half years, Christ comes into Jerusalem. And he's coming actually to, this is the Passion Week, he's coming really to die for our sins, to go to the cross. Uh, and uh, this chapter gives us many affirmations of his saviorhood and of uh, his love and what he did for us. Uh, some unbelievers, today we're, we're suddenly in a, a, it looks like a world that's gone mad not only uh, in the Ukraine, for which we pity and we pray, but uh, we see in America uh, unbelieving things and uh, uh, many leaving the faith and denying the faith on TV and all that, making jokes about uh, relig uh, Christianity. But uh, when our Lord came into uh, Jerusalem here, we know that three, he came to die and he made it clear three and a half years before, you know, some, uh, I, I've dealt with a lot of my Jewish relatives, you know, who will say this and that, but Jesus made it clear at the beginning of his ministry, he was going to die on the cross for our sins. And you remember he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And you see, he was speaking not of the temple. He, was, he said something that they would not forget. You don't forget when somebody stands in front of the great temple and says, destroy it, and I'm going to build it up again. It was, you couldn't forget it. But they didn't understand it. But that's part of the, the genius of they wouldn't forget it. And of course, he was speaking of the temple of his body. Destroy this body crucify this body, and in three days I will raise it up. 
And uh, saying that in such a striking way gives a refutation immediately for those, you know, some say, oh, well, it was just bad luck, bad karma that they crucified Jesus. He was a nice guy, but they crucified him at the end of uh, three years. It was a shame, but the disciples made him the Messiah. But uh, no, he was, of course, the Christ from, uh, from eternity and from birth, and he came to die for our sins. And so at the very beginning, he made it clear, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. And uh, they couldn't forget a saying like that. And uh, now he's coming to see it through. And he, there's the prophecy, we have the affirmation of his Christhood, of his being the Messiah in Zechariah, 600 years before this time. The prophet Zechariah gave this prophecy, quoted in, of course, the book of Zechariah, and quoted, though, right here in the, the passage in Matthew 21. Verse 5. Tell you the daughter of Zion, behold, the king comes unto thee meek and sitting upon a donkey. And a donkey, the fall of a donkey. Now the rabbis, you know, beforehand, they said, well, Messiah will ride into Jerusalem. And by the way, the Jewish rabbis, the, one of the most famous Talmudic rabbis named Simon ben Jokai, no joke, but his name was Simon ben Jokai. Uh, he's recording the Talmud in commenting on this verse and says, this is the, the Messiah. The Messiah must ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And uh, we have in the Talmud, he's followed by Rabbi ben Joseph, who says, uh, we already have seen the days of the Messiah. King Hezekiah was the Messiah. And Rabbi Simon ben Jokai said, no, Hezekiah could not be the Messiah because he never rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. And so uh, this was what was needed. And again, Jerusalem at that time uh, was hilly. It had ruts in it. It had a valley in the middle. You know, through the years, uh, valleys get filled in and holes get filled in. And you go to Jerusalem today, it's pretty flat. It's not totally flat. But uh, in those days, a donkey is sure-footed. So a donkey was the better animal to, to ride on than they used to in these places. Horses, of course, are fast in flat territory, but horses are not sure-footed. Horses slip. And so the donkey was the animal you used. You know, remember it said Absalom rode on a donkey. Why did, he, why did he ride on a horse? It's faster. Well, no, horses slip. And I, I think I've said before that uh, in the Grand Canyon, if you want to pay uh, $50 to ride down the canyon on the Kaibab Trail, you ride on a donkey. If you ride on a horse, you won't come back. <laughs> Horses slip. They, nobody's putting anybody on a horse. Donkeys don't slip. They may be stubborn. They may not be as pretty, but they don't slip. Could apply to some people, maybe. But the rabbis debated whether the, the Hebrew, you could interpret it two, way, uh, two ways. In Zechariah 9, 6, and again, quote it right here uh, in verse Matthew 21, verse 5. Thy king comes unto thee, meek and sitting upon a donkey and a colt of a donkey. Uh, you could translate that word and see in the Hebrew, the, and, or even. In other words, it could mean two things. He's going to sit upon a donkey and come in, even that is a young donkey. It's going to be a young donkey. A donkey, even a young donkey. Or it can be interpreted, he's going to ride in on a donkey with and a baby donkey. And the rabbis debated, which does it mean? And you notice Jesus to make it very clear says here, there's going to be a donkey 
and it will have a colt. Bring them both. So by riding it on a donkey with the colt of a donkey, it is absolutely clear that he is purposely filling, fulfilling this prophecy. And he is claiming to be the Messiah. Of course, he has done it all. Many people say, oh, Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. Oh, that's, of course, silly. When he said, I am the light of the world. When you, once you say, I am the light of the world, you, you're making a messianic claim. I am the He that thirsteth, let him come unto me. That's a messianic claim. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's a messianic claim. And so we have absolute assurance that our Savior is the Christ. And while many prophecies were fulfilled by others forcing the crucifixion, he fulfills this prophecy and uh, clearly is right. And it says in uh, verse 8, a great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches, and the multitudes cried, Hosanna. Uh, somebody asked me, actually, in a brethren assembly, was it fair for God to require Israel to accept Jesus as the Messiah uh, because they didn't, a lot of them thought of a military leader or something like that? Well, the point here, though, is it's, over, it's more than fair. Jesus was in a small country for three and a half years. For three and a half years, he healed people. So it wasn't just we heard, well, he, heard a blind, he healed a blind person and, and that's ended. We heard every few months he healed a blind person. We heard every few months he healed a, he healed a leper. He healed a crippled person. He had a healing ministry for three and a half years, so everybody heard of it. Everybody heard of the news. And uh, these, of course, were miracles predicted uh, in Isaiah that the Messiah would, uh, when the Messiah came, the lame would walk, the blind would see, the lepers would be cl uh, cleansed. So overwhelmingly, for three and a half years, they had the testimony of Christ healing. They had the testimony of his holy life. They had the testimony of his teaching. You know, Christ is a better teacher than all, uh, than all the 70 volumes, 70 volumes in the Talmud. He's a better teacher than all of the, the rabbis put together. And none of them healed. So clearly, they knew Jesus. They knew Christ. And when he rode in, they shouted, verse 9, Hosanna, the son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Uh, it would have been nice if I brought uh, palm branches and handed them out to everybody. And uh, some people would say that's wonderful. Another, uh, some other people might say, why is he doing that? That's, you know, showing off. And we could have a controversy about palm branches. But... They saw he was coming in, and they, they grabbed and cut palm branches, and they're waving them. That's, a, that's their salute to the Savior after three and a half years of healing and teaching. And when they said, Hosanna, you remember, and I, we should say this every Palm Sunday, but you remember Hosanna is Shua, like Jesus, Jehovah saves, Yeah. Shua, Yesh, abbreviation for Jehovah, Yahweh, Shua saves. Ho in Hebrew is cause, cause something to happen. So Ho Shua means cause to save or save. Na means now. So you see Ho Shua Na is Ho cause Shua part of life, Jesus' name, Yeshua, nah. And so when they're yelling Hosanna, they're saying, and they can understand it, cause to save, save us now. And so now he's the Messiah, he's done this, and of course 
Every, people are thinking different things. Some people may think he's about to uh, announce the revolution and we're going to get an army and we're going to drive the Romans out. Others may think he's going to, by miraculous power, drive the Romans out and all that. But here he comes, and it's only right that we acknowledge him after what a wonderful teaching ministry, a holy ministry, and fulfilling the prophecies. And so they're shouting, here he is, he's coming, it, it's Zechariah be fulfilled. Hosh, save us now, save us now, save us now, save us now, save us now. And as he rides through, Lord, save us now, save us now, Hosanna. The Messianic reading from Psalm 118. And uh, a wonderful, glorious sight. And uh, mirrors a little, perhaps, of his second coming. What will we shout when he comes again and every eye shall see him? Uh, so he comes, and of course he was coming to die for our sins, and we understand that. So amid the happiness is the reality of the great redemption is about to happen. And... Uh, it said, verse 10, when he was come up to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, you know, who is this? It's the prophet Jesus from, now, from Galilee. Now, it appears that the ones who cheered him on and loved him and strewed their garments and yelled, Hosanna, they, they knew what he did. Many, no doubt, uh, most have believed. They trusted him. They saw he was the Messiah. They didn't have all the theology straight. Uh, did, did they realize he was the second person of the Trinity? Probably not. Even a Christian, to be saved, you don't have to necessarily believe all the theology at once. You have to accept Christ as Savior, and then as you grow in Christ, you learn more. But the shock is, how could one week later the multitude say, crucify him, free Barabbas? Well, no doubt part of it was that uh, the multitude led by the high priest that said crucify him uh, were a lot of visitors. Uh, Josephus estimated that a half a million visitors came at Passover time. And so we have the group that saw him do miracles that were healed by him. Imagine if somebody in your family was healed by him. Imagine if he was here today, we'd line up. Lord, we, boy, this morning I, uh, I say hello to people and everybody says, oh my, uh, I have this ailment and that ailment. When you're older, people tell you there are ailments. When you're younger, they tell you what school they're going to or something like that. Middle age, they tell you how their job's doing or how their babies are growing. But when you're older, they say, oh, you know, they have your, your ailments. But uh, these people praise Jesus, and we have Palm Sunday, and it was marvelous. It was right. It was just. It was fair. It was affirming. But when the visitors come, more visitors are going to come this week. And when the visitors come... They're going to be led by the high priest that, remember, with the, the mob and the high priest says, we free Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And some of them don't know who he is yet. And so the mob is going to turn. And, uh, oh, we see that. Then in verse 12, it says, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast them out that sold and bought of the temple and overthrew the tables, the money changers, and said unto him, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer. By the way, you know, the, the Palm Sunday reminds us of the challenge of life. Do we acknowledge Christ? Uh, there's a great temptation today to deny the Lord because there's so many people who deny the Lord. And... Uh, which side are we going to line up when Christ comes down the road at Palm Sunday? Do we line up with those who love him and believe him? Or do we stand beside the high priest and the Pharisees who uh, are looking at us and may maybe they don't, we don't want to be seen 
cheering for Jesus because they're against him. Well, of course, we want to stand for the Lord. But anyway, he came in verse 12, and it says he cast out all that sold and bought in the temple. The, at Passover, you wanted to have a sheep to sacrifice, a lamb. Well, most people didn't bring a lamb, you know, if they traveled 40 miles or such. Some probably did. But what you do is you go to the market and you'd buy a lamb. So many people bought lambs at Passover, they, they called the market later the sheep market. And then the temple group required that you have a clean lamb, that you have it washed. So what would you do? You'd go over to the pool of Siloam, and there they would charge you a, a drachma or whatever, a shekel, whatever it was, to uh, wash your sheep. You know, you, need a, you want to take that sheep into the temple to sacrifice for Passover or something? Well, you need to have a clean sheep. Okay, well, you need a bucket of water. Well, that's one drachma right here now. And so that became called the sheep pool. So you have got the sheep market and the sheep pool because at Passover, that's what was, was happening. And then if you wanted to give a donation, you know, and Lord, I'm giving this donation, uh, bless me, and you might even pray for somebody, not that you could buy it, like uh, uh, they said you couldn't give Roman money, you had to give Hebrew money. So you had to have a trade, and when you traded, they took a little cut in the money so you could give it, and we understand that. And apparently they got closer and closer to the temple. You know, if you were 100 yards out, you'd get a little business, but why not get by the gate of the temple where everybody was coming with their washed sheep now or whatever, and you get more business. And so pretty soon, Instead of in the temple where we'd go in the temple and you'd say to your child, be now don't talk loud, people are praying and we're gonna pray, and you go in and you're gonna pray, you'd hear rather, you know, bucket of change your money here with Big Jim for two shekels, we give the best bargain. No, no, here's Big Al, change your money here, you get it? No, and the climate of the temple was changing from a place of prayer to a place of uh, business. You know, when we drove down here, I, I got a, a new used car, and with it comes Cirrus Radio, and we're playing, the, the, what's coming through is the songs of the 50s, rock and roll of the 50s, I'm not, a, by the way, a rock and roll person, do not, but it keeps you awake. I like the station, which is uh, Symphony Hall, but Symphony Hall put, can put you to sleep. So you need to drive with the wild station a little. I'm not saying, it's not bad, but you know, you hear Elvis or whatever, but it keeps you awake. And sometimes if you, you get annoyed by the song, that's even better to keep you awake. But today, it's, it's, today is uh, Palm Sunday. So when we drove, drove you know, right over to here, we put on Symphony Hall where they're playing music fit, on a fitting for Palm Sunday. They're playing Palm Sunday, things written 100, 200 years ago in Europe for Palm Sunday. And it's worshipful and it's beautiful and uh, such. But, uh, the atmosphere of the temple was changed. And at the very beginning of his ministry, you remember Jesus turned over the table. Some people said, oh, that was, wasn't that a, a sin? No, no, it was righteous indignation. He turned over the tables. He didn't kill anybody. He turned over their tables. Get out of here, come on. Biz, not, don't have business right under here. Just like we, we wouldn't want anybody to be selling Bibles right you know, inside. Well, maybe Bibles, I don't know. You can <laughs> decide. but. Uh, Jesus turned over the tables and said the temple is a place for prayer and we should pray there and not be making it a place of business. So now three and, a, three and a half years ago, he's there. It doesn't surprise, he does the same thing again. Did it at the beginning of his ministry, does it at the end of his ministry. 
because he, he gives us that one of the testimonies that he's the Christ is the testimony of a holy life. A holy life and courageous. Somebody might say, you know, Lord, uh, the, 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 the big guy gets a cut. The high priest, the big guy, gets a cut from all the money that's uh, traded on the tables. And uh, Jesus turned them over because it was right. Jesus gives us the testimony of being holy. And uh, he cast them out of the temple. And uh, verse 15, when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. Verse 15, now why were they displeased? Displeased that he healed? Of course, they had said before that he healed by uh, Beelzebub. There, there was a, a jealousy. Of course, we have to watch that we don't get jealous, you know, on, on holy things. And, uh, but uh, they, were, they were also maybe angry at God that the announcements of the Christ came in Galilee. It didn't, it didn't come to the high priest in the temple because they weren't righteous. And so it says they were, they were angry they would have killed him, but they didn't grab him in the daytime, it says, because they feared the people. They didn't want to start a riot. They wanted to grab him at night. That's why they see they had Judas show where he was at night, and Judas led them, remember, to the Garden of Gethsemane and said the one he would kiss would be the Messiah. And they grabbed him at night when no one would see it. And we understand even today Things that happen at night sometimes are, are done in duplicity and such. And uh, he, uh, <clears throat> and he's teaching all the time. Verse 19, and when he saw a fig tree, he came to it and found nothing but leaves only and said, let no fruit grow on it and henceforth forever. And we understand that his teaching even during this time of the right after the Palm Sunday, the fig tree often represented the nation of Israel. And he sees this fig tree filled with leaves, but it doesn't have any fruit when it should have had some fruit. And now he's going to teach the 12 and he's going to teach us for 2000 years. And he, he curses the fig tree. Some, some have written, oh, he lost the temper. Well, he loses his temper in righteousness. Sometimes there's a time to lose your temper at evil and it hurt, but he cursed the fig tree that uh, he said that, that no one will uh, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. And he's really did it as a picture of the outward nation of Israel. See, he, he's the great prophet. He knows what's going to happen. And he says that this fig tree, which represents Israel, it has the temple, it has the high priest, it has the priest and the Levites and all of this. And he says, but right now it's a show and not belief. It's a show, but they can't love. If you hate the savior, you don't love God. Some people say, oh, I, I love God, but I, I don't accept Jesus. Well, then you don't really love God. You're, you're misinformed and fooling yourself. If you reject Moses, you'd rejected God. If you rejected Isaiah, you rejected God's prophet. If you reject Jesus, the son, you've rejected the father. And so in that the fig tree would die and was really his, his prophetic way of telling us that, that Israel was going to be taken away and destroyed. But of course we have other passages in the, in the Bible and we know in the end, from Romans 11 and the book of Revelation, that God is going to save the nation Israel. That is cause a conversion in Israel in the end of the age. And to get, to get a converted Israel, you had to have Jews back in Israel. And for centuries, people said, oh, the Jews will never go back to Israel. The Jews will never go back to Israel. But we're the generation that has seen 
uh, and Israel because of Hitler, because of Stalin. And now we're seeing Ukrainian Jews pouring back to Israel. I'm, I'm not saying it's good. The, the, this, this thing is Putin is evil. What's happening is tragic. But out of the tragedy, Ukrainian Jews are going to Israel and really setting the stage in the end for Jesus to come and of course to, to lift his church, but to, to save them. And we see all these things, verse 23, and when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him when he was teaching and they said, by what authority do you do these things? Who gave you this authority? <clears throat> if you would study the rabbis, the Talmud is about 50 times bigger than the Bible, but the Bible's better. But there's 70 volumes in the, in the what do we say, the, the, the Rebecca, printing, Rebecca printing series of uh, the Talmud. And as you can turn it to any page, you can grab any volume and just split it open, turn it to any page, and you'll read, Rabbi Jose said uh, in, the in the name of Rabbi Simon, his teacher, everybody that says anything quotes their teacher. I mean, that's, that's the world they lived in. Anybody that says anything of authority does it not just with their own self, but they quote their teacher. Rabbi Simon quotes Rabbi Abraham. Rabbi Abraham quotes Rabbi Ben-Gora. They, they all quote their teacher. And that's why, and they prayed quoting their teachers. And Jesus, when he prayed, did not quote the teachers. It, it says he, he taught with authority. He taught with authority because, of course, he was the Christ. And we, though, we quote our teachers again. We quote Jesus. We quote Paul. We quote the Bible. And so they say, uh, you know, who gave you uh, this authority, Galilean? And Jesus said, I will ask you one thing. Now, again, if you would open the Talmud, you would find that their method of discussion was to reply to a question with a question. Now, we don't have to vote whether we like that method or we don't like the method, that's what they did. And if you were asked a question, it was normal for you to ask another question. It might just be simple, it might just be says, who says so? Or why do you ask that? Or tell me first what you're going to do with the answer. And they said by what, and so Jesus says, <clears throat> verse 24, I will ask you one thing, and if you tell me the answer, I'll tell you the answer. <coughs> now, by the way, we've seen this recently, haven't we, without going Democrat, Republican, whether you like the Supreme Court nominee or not. But the big question, remember, came, well, can you define a woman? Because of all this woke business and transgender business, it was asked, well, well what's a woman? And the reply came, well, uh, I really can't tell you what a woman is. And so we have this uh, verbal jostling uh, for people with uh, viewpoints. But <clears throat> he said, you asked me by what authority, <clears throat> let me ask you a question. By what authority did John, did John the Baptist come? Do you, the baptism of John, verse 25, whence was it, from heaven or for men? Well, that's the big question. John the Baptist came saying, the Christ is about to come, cleanse yourself. Repent of your sins. Devote yourself to God. Cleanse yourself. And as a sign that you are cleansing yourself in preparation for the Christ's appearance, uh, we're going to outwardly wash you with water. Now we know, uh, we, we don't know completely whether they were dipped, dunked, poured, and all that. People argue about that. But the, the idea was you're cleansing yourself in preparation for the Christ. And so outwardly testified everybody by getting washed. 
not scrub, but just having some water applied, symbolizing your cleansing. Now, by the way, Christian baptism is when you say you've trusted in Christ and you believe in Christ and uh, uh, Christ has cleansed you. So it's a little, John, John the Baptist baptism was, was a baptism of repentance, uh, waiting for the Messiah. Christian baptism is the sacrament of entering into the church, so to speak. And so he says, uh, well, the baptism of John. John was a holy preacher. John uh, denounced sin. He denounced the Herods for their sin. And of course he was beheaded, but was, from John, was John from God or from men? Well, that's, that's the key question. See, the person back there said, yeah, the baby. The question with Muhammad. I bought a used car recently. We bought a used car. It's nice. I'm very happy. But uh, uh, at Reed Nissan Claremont, most of the salespeople are, are Arab. And I tried to testify, and uh, I, I came and I said, you know, I've been in, in Egypt and Arabia. So I said, Marhaba, that's hello in Arabic. And they all go, Marhaba, and they, run, and they hug me. Honestly, they hug me. They hug me for a Marhaba. And then, thank you. I say at the end, Shukran. Whatever they give me, a cup of coffee, Shukran. Oh, Shukran. And they say, Afwan, which is, you're welcome. And honestly, I, I get about three hugs every time I go in there with a car problem or whatever because of this little exchange in, 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 in this. But the question with Islam is, is Muhammad a self-appointed prophet or is he from God? The question with the Mormons, was Joseph Smith a self-appointed prophet or he, was he from God? And that's that, of course, we as Christians, we don't believe in any of these. We, we believe they are self-appointed. Paul starts his letters. Paul called, you see, by God, called to be an apostle, meaning he didn't decide, oh, I want to be an apostle. Called. If Paul was called by God, then we, we read his books and uh, observe. And so Jesus says, was John from God or is John a self-appointed guy? And uh, the people believe John was a prophet and he was a prophet, he was a great prophet. But these high priests, they knew if they said, well, John was, a, was from God, John's main function was to recognize the Messiah and to anoint him and to, uh, or to be baptized him to it. He was the one who opened the doors, so to speak, for the Messiah, for Christ. He fulfilled that function. He, and if you reject Jesus, you reject John. If you accept John, you accept Jesus. And so they didn't want to say they rejected John because the people thought John was a prophet and they were afraid they'd be mobbed. So they reasoned with themselves, verse 25, and uh, they said, if we shall say of he's from men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, we, we, don't, we can't tell. Like we can't tell what a woman is. We can't tell. And Jesus said, well, then neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. But here we have Palm Sunday it is a great moment in the Christian calendar. Christ comes to Jerusalem. He fulfills the prophecy of Zechariah. He shows holiness in cleansing the temple. He shows power. He went to the cross voluntarily. He showed his power by healing. He could still heal. He didn't run, his power didn't run out. And he has this holy testimony 
and, and we say on Palm Sunday, Hosanna, O Lord, save us. And of course, he saved us by dying on the cross. And we have a wonderful savior. And we want to be among those people on the road that salute Jesus, that openly acknowledge Jesus, that aren't ashamed of Jesus' name, that testify for Jesus because he came to die on the cross for us. And Palm Sunday is a, is a great Sunday. Of course, the Resurrection Sunday is even greater. But may we, what a wonderful God to send us the Christ, to send us one we could shout, Hosanna, and uh, maybe that's what we'll shout when he comes again. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the wonderful salvation. We have, thank you for wonderful friends that we have in, even here among other Christians and for their sympathy and kindness to one another. We thank thee that you answer prayer and you can heal and answer to prayer. So bless all your people, bless the children here and the grandchildren and uh, may the Lord come soon and we pray for thy deliverance of many people in the Ukraine and we pray for thy peace in Christ's name.